We start at the courthouse with our friend and colleague, co-anchor Chris Jansing, who was in the court's overflow room this morning. So, Chris, tell us, you know, what you saw. How did the president react as Donald Cohn, uh, Michael Cohn, rather, uh, completed that cross-examination, tough cross-examination? Look, I think that this was a critical day, right? This was the defense's last best chance to really cut into the story of the man everyone calls the star witness here, the person who was entrusted with bringing all those disparate pieces together. I just came down from uh, the 15th floor and happened to be on the elevator alone with Andrew Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani's son. So, of course, I asked him to get a little view. He's been here about three weeks almost every day. And I, and I wanted to get a sense of the people around Donald Trump, uh, what they're thinking, not surprisingly, uh, whether it's what they believe or, or what they're saying. He thinks that uh, Todd Blanche has done a great job. He thinks Michael Cohen, although controlled, is someone he suggests uh, may have perjured himself again on the stand. They're not buying what he's selling. Let's talk about the ways in which Todd Blanche tried to poke those holes into uh, what the jury is seeing here. I think, you know, if you look at the big picture, it's how they want to paint Michael Cohen as a liar and a thief. Many times today, as we've heard in the past, he was asked about whether he lied about something, whether he told the truth about something, and he would have to answer, no, sir. Uh, but I think the other big moment was when he said, you stole from the Trump organization, right? And he said, yes, sir. And that was one of the few times today when Donald Trump really seemed to sit up and take notice. Uh, this was when Alan Weisselberg gave him $50,000 uh, to pay to a tech company, and he kept 30000 of it, and he wanted to get to that detail. Um, Todd Blanche did. He said, did you have a duffel bag full of cash? And he said, no, it was a brown paper bag. So that's all part of the sort of liar and thief that they're trying to paint with Michael Cohen and have been from the beginning. Also, they use Trump, right? Um, that he always had his name on the st stationery, that um, he was the, the personal attorney, but also an opportunist that he had six clients uh, over the course of a year and made $4 million. Somebody who was always looking to get something out of Donald Trump by doing what he thought Donald Trump wanted, not necessarily what Donald Trump had told him to do, which, of course, is at the heart of this. And the other thing they went on for quite a while that was was Michael Cohen distracted at this key time when they were setting up the hush money payments. He had so many other things going on. Uh, Tiffany Trump had uh, somebody dealing with her uh, for a blackmail. There were taxi medallion issues. Uh, of course, there were the ongoing uh, situation with the uh, Access Hollywood tape and, and a big endorsement they were getting as well from the niece of Martin Luther King Jr. So the suggestion being he really had a lot of other things going on. And then for that key phone call where Michael Cohen says he kept Donald Trump updated, he is actually doing and could have been updating him on any number of other things. There are so many interesting things that happen when you come here. And Katie, you're very well aware of how different it is. I think you talked about this on Friday, uh, on Thursday. Um, who is this Michael Cohen? The man on the stand again today disciplined, fairly soft-spoken. Once or twice, he may, I would even say sparred. He, he kind of went back at Todd Blanche, but overall, the complete opposite of the person that you know, that anyone who's covered him knows, that anybody who's watched his podcast knows, anybody who's watched interview on television with him knows. Uh, yes, sir, no, sir, subdued and disciplined. I think the other thing is that when we started court today, and we've all been following this very, very closely. And uh, you hear the official announcement, the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump. There is something about those few words that really hits you. It, it makes you understand why when I got here at 6.30 this morning, there were people I talked to had been lined up. The first and second people who were here got in line at 6 a.m. on Saturday. That's how long they were waiting. The guy who was about 20th in line who I spoke to is a lawyer from Montreal. He drove here overnight. 
got here at about two o'clock in the morning when I asked him, why would you do that? And he said, there is no bigger case as a lawyer. What bigger case am I ever going to have a chance to see? Also raised some questions about whether this should be televised. We've had those conversations before. But I think one of the other things that was really interesting is Donald Trump did have his eyes closed much of the time. In the overflow room, you have that camera that is pointed directly at the defense table. His eyes were shut. Was he sleeping? Was he contemplating? Was he just bored? I will say there were a number of times when I saw, for example, Alan Dershowitz, uh, who was sitting right behind him, yawning, the judge trying to adjust himself in the seat as some of the questioning and some of the details went on and on and on. But when his supporters came in, Donald Trump stood. He stood for a couple of minutes, made sure he saw them, made sure they saw him looking at him, including the members of Congress, including Dershowitz, including Eric and Lara Trump. And finally, I think maybe the most significant thing that might have happened today happened before anybody even came into court. And that, of course, was the decision by the judge that they're not going to start closing until next Tuesday. And that is something that had been a big question. Would they allow that much time potentially to pass with the holiday weekend between a closing and deliberation or just start deliberation and then go home for three days? The judge made it clear that's not going to happen. Uh, talking to uh, a number of our legal folks who were around there, uh, the general consensus is, and I'm sure you've had this conversation, that uh, that is a, a good benefit for the prosecution. They did not want the jury to go home after having these, having heard all of their evidence and then having heard the closing and then wait to deliberate. So that's going to happen on Tuesday. But I will say, smallish crowd of protesters here, a uh, very long line of people waiting to get in, and we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel next week, closing and then the deliberation for these 12 jurors.